to the next talk. Somewhat related topic has to do with sampling function, but over sampling. It is. In high dimensions? Yes. How do you over sample in high dimensions? <laughs> that is difficult. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> Sounds very interesting. So, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm Yan Jong from Ohio State, and and thank you for the invitation for the talk. And it's really nice to be here. This is my first time to visit South Carolina. I really enjoyed the my stay here, and really liked the talk organized in this spring school, and really inspiring lectures from all other different fields. And I I could have. Uh, when I enjoy the lecture, I can see more overview of what other different fields are have working on and what is the big theme is going on behind this. So today I will talk about function approximation with oversampling. So here is the overview of this talk. So first I will introduce the problem setup I'm interested in. And then two topics will be discussed. One is optimal strategy for least squares, and the other one is correcting data corruption errors. At the end, I will summarize these two results. So I'm interested in approximating unknown function f using its data. So to do this, we consider an approximation, which has the form of a linear combination of some basis functions BJ. So the goal is we want to construct an accurate approximation by using samples of f by determining unknown coefficient vector c. And especially uh, we focus on oversampled case where the number of data is greater than the number of unknowns or number of bases. The standard approach seeks seek to find an approximation whose coefficients minimize the errors. This can be formulated by the following minimization problem. Here, f is the data vector. It's a vector of samples of unknown function f. And the a is the model matrix, or bond of the line matrix. I didn't specify the norm here, so obviously, different norm induces different methods. For example, when two norm is used, this results in the well-known least squares method. When one norm is used, this results in least absolute deviation method. So these two methods I will talk about today. First, let me talk about optimal strategy for least squares. Suppose we have sufficiently large number of samples or data, then the list of squares expected to produce an accurate approximation. However, collecting that large number of data could be resource intensive if the data collecting procedure requires some expensive numerical simulations or experiments. For example, so let's say 100,000 samples guarantees you the best solution. But if the collecting a single data costs $1, then you need $100,000. So the question I want to answer is, what if you only have $1,000, which corresponds to 1,000 data? Then can you still expect to construct an accurate approximation? So this is the, the, the problem, the first topic we'll be concerned about. So the little m is the new thing. Yes, little so m. So this is the number of points. Yeah, number of using. Yeah, exactly. So small m will be and denoted. The, and large m is sort of the reference. That would be ideal. Is that exactly, right? exactly. So if you use capital M number of sample points, which is large, then this guarantees you accurate solution. But small n is the number of sample points one can afford. Yes. So for simplicity of discussion, we use orthogonal polynomials as our basis. 
So our basis satisfies the following orthogonality with respect to some probability measure omega here. And we use the total degree polynomial space as our approximation space, which defined as follows. So the dimensionality of this space, or the number of bases we are going to use, is p, which is n plus d choose d. Then the least squares method seeks to find the coefficients which minimize the data and the approximation in the in terms of the two norm. And it is well known that the least square solution can be explicitly written as following form. The typical approach would be Monte Carlo. The procedure is very, pretty simple. First, we draw samples from the orthogonal, orthogonal probability measure, omega here, and then we solve just least squares problem. And here, omega, is comes from the orthogonality of the basis here. It was shown by uh, Cohen and his students and colleagues by Ed back in 2013 that to obtain stable and accurate least square result, the number of samples used for least square satisfies these conditions. So for the best case where the Chebyshev polynomials are used, the number of samples has to grow at least of, of order p log p. But usually, the number of samples has to grow p squared. All right. Then, if, we, if someone already has that many sufficiently large number of data, then the standard Monte Carlo least squared should produce an accurate result, approximation result. But what if? The number of data one can afford, which denoted by small m, which way much smaller than capital N, but still large enough to satisfy the problem overdetermined. Then the question becomes where we collect the data. This, this question can be formulated by the subset selection problem. So given capital M candidate sample points, then which small m point should we use in order to the least square solution on the small m points is close enough to the least square solution on the capital M candidate sample points. So actually, the point selection can be done by row selections in the model matrix. So let me illustrate this equivalence in the next slide. Suppose we have five by three matrix, model matrix. And each row corresponds to a point, and let's say x1, x2, and x5. Suppose we choose x1, x3, and x5. Then this corresponds to selecting first, third, fifth rows. Then by collecting these selected rows, we can construct a small size model matrix. <coughs> then in the small size model matrix, each row corresponds to a point, x1, x3, x5. And we denote this row selection operator by Sm. So by multiplying Sm to the model matrix, we can have a small size model matrix. Then the natural question to ask is, what is the optimal selection? Let's say uh, C hat capital M be the least square solution by using capital M number of points. Uh, we, this should result in a good approximation. And also, for any choice of the small m points, or equivalently small m rows, we have small size least square system, and that small least square system produce the least square solution. And here we denote it by C has small m. And obviously, this depends on the row selection operator. <clears throat> then optimal row selection operator should minimize the difference between the big least square solution and the small least square solution. So this is the ideal optimal selection. Despite of how hard this problem is, this problem is unfortunately unsolvable because this involves c hat 
this requires full informational data at capital M. So capital and this requires capital M samples data from the unknown function. But if we already have this data, then we can just use this solution. So no, you still have to solve a much larger least squares problem. Yes, that's true. That's true. But I mean the solving of the least squares is more expensive than just looking at the data. Isn't it? Uh, yes, that's true. But so the main I, cost is, in, is the least square solution. You can think of that way, but what I assuming is like I'm collecting. But I think it's, it's a different focus. Like I what see. I assume okay. is like collecting data is more expensive. Then how can um, we deal with the, this one? So once we have a big data, then you assume that least square problem can be solved. Yes. So this, so the real optimality is unavailable without having the full information of the data. So we propose a quasi-optimality, which defined uh, by this S quantity. This S quantity is defined on any size of matrix, and for any matrix of A, or for matrix A, whose uh, with the p columns, um, then s of a is defined as follows. It is one over p's power of square root of determinant of a transpose a over product of its column nodes. This s quantity is designed to directly minimize the big least square solution and the small least square solution. And this s quantity enjoys some properties. And first, this S value always lies between 0 to 1. And also, S value is always 0 if the matrix has more columns than rows. And one important feature of this S quantity is if a matrix A has its S value of 1, if and only if columns of the matrix are mutually orthogonal. And this is the property we are going to um, use. Now with this as, of, as quantity, then we can define the quasi-optimal subset. The quasi-optimal. Can, can you give us interpretation of this quantity, German? Is there any interpretation? Ah, yeah. For example, if A is a square matrix, then this becomes a determinant. Right. And determinant over product of its, its column nodes. So if, if, the, if a matrix are mutually orthogonal, like for example, identity matrix, then the product of column norm should be equal to the determinant. So what this measuring is the difference between the maximum determinant they can possibly have or with their column norm and uh, what, they, what their determinant is, is the ratio between them. This is M by P matrix, so what is it? Yeah, I said it does, the number of rows doesn't matter in this case because, yeah, number P, of no, P is the number of columns. Exactly, right? yeah, P is the number of columns. And one over P's power is just the average in it. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the quasi optimal subset is a set of M point which maximizes its value. It's okay, S value. It's, it's, it's not a surrogate of your L, right? It's an indicator of your L. I'm sorry? It's, 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 it, there's no direct relation between that optimal error and this quantity. No, no, no. It's uh, motivated by... By your deviation from... Exactly. Because the true optimality is un unavailable because it this involves the function information inside. So I skip the detailed motivation for defining this one, but underlying thing is we want to maximize the determinant at the same time we can we want to enforce the column of orthogonality so that's why this property become important so one feature of this uh, quasi optimal set is this is irrespective of data as you can see this s value does not involve any function information so this is irrespective of data then with this quasi-optimal subset in mind, now we are in a position to 
present our quality optimal strategy for least square. First, we draw a sample from the orthogonal probability measure, omega. And again, this comes from the, our basis. And then we construct the model matrix. And up to here is the same procedure to the Monte Carlo approach. And third step, we by applying the S optimality, we obtain the quasi-optimal subset of small m points. So this procedure will tell you which points should you collect the data. After that, we actually collect the data only on that well-selected point. And then we just solve least squares problem only for small m points. And let me directly show the its performance. To, so here is our numerical examples. So here are the test functions we used. In 2D, we used the Frankie function. For other dimensional case, we borrow two functions from GANs. One is continuous, the other one is corner pick. First example is for Frankie function in 2D. We here we fix the polynomial degree to be 20. And since we use the total degree polynomial space as our approximation space, this corresponds to a uh, number of bases, P, to be 231 in this case. So therefore, we are in an overdetermined, oversampled case. The number of samples used for least square starts from 231 plus 1, which oversampled by one point. So here are the error plot with respect to number of uh, samples. And to compare against other method, we also show the results by MC and QMC, uh, by purple and blue line, respectively. For reference solution, we also show the result by Monte Carlo list square using 100,000 sample points, which satisfies P square, greater than P square. So it should result in a good approximation result. One can clearly see that the errors by the quasi-optimal least square are very close to the reference solution by using 100,000 sample points. And also, the quasi-optimal least square shows notably, uh, notably small error compared to those of MC and QMC. It's amazing. Can you show us the function again, how smooth it was? This one? This this French function has a full local fix, local fix in the okay, that's cool. domain. Yeah. It was, otherwise, it's very slow. So we go to X minus drive C. The blue lines are essentially random selection. Exactly. But of the same number. Yes. Yes. Of the same number, and um, your improvement is because you always fix. Exactly. Exactly. So, what about sensitivity towards errors? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I put, used to put some effort on to some an analysis on that, but it's really hard to do this because first thing is it based it first based on the candidate point, and even the for candidate point. It's a little hard to measure how things interacted with because this involves. You, you can do that uh, numerically. You can just put some noise in the data and see how that will affect it. Ah, okay. Then I will. I, will, I have a condition number plot yes. in the next next slide. So. Yeah, is it, in, but I'm more interested in in a sense if you if you collect your data points. Mm -hmm. And not to have the regular additive noise, but simply simply have some of the data points corrupted completely. Uh, so if you have, say, 5% of the data is corrupted, how so this will affect? That's a good question. I haven't tested it yet, but when you say corrupted, is there, are you meaning that the random noise? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, okay, if that is the case, then this should work well. No, not random noise, simply you choose random number there. And the number, then I don't believe. <laughs> because we just just to show, assuming that you collect some good data point, and this just to show the 
that's to indicate that you you can still design similar <coughs> method, but kind of make a little bit of assurance, to just of a sample a little bit, in order to avoid the the, uh, the problem that you say two of the data points are corrupted, mm -hmm. uh, then that will not uh, make your approximation very bad. That's a very interesting question. So, so let me make sure we can understand what the selection of your points was independent of the mm. function being approximated? Not independent. Not independent. So once I get, yes. Yeah. <coughs> once I you know, the, the question is the cost, right? Mm -hmm. How much does it cost me to select the points if I'm sampling the function anyway? Exactly. Sitting in there as opposed to just the brute force sampling. Exactly. So what I do usually, like people ask for the points sometimes for this one. Then I can just simply generate the point and just send them out, and they just collect the data on that, that specific point because this is irrespective of the irrespective of function. So, yeah. Then, where so, the, so do do they or do they not depend upon the function the points? Do not depend. On. They do not. Do not. And just on the, and on can, the basis. I can right? give a very yeah, on the basis. Because of the very basis. On which basis. You're, okay. Yeah, basis. Okay. And, and uh, I, can, I can give a very clear explanation for this. So where am I? Where am I? So <laughs> okay. So this is great when your evaluation of your function is very expensive. Yes. So yes, each yes, of these points could yes, be a full bloody simulation yes. on a parallel machine. So anyway, so the quantile to least sphere converge just converge after just a few of a sample points in this case. Mm -hmm. And here are the error convergence with respect to increasing polynomial degree from five to twenty. And since and here we adopt oversampling rate alpha. And the results are shown here, and two oversampling rates are used. So the results of oversampling rate of 1.2 are shown by solid lines here. And results of the oversampling rate of 3 are shown by dotted line here. And we can clearly see that the quasi-optimal least square shows nice exponential error convergence for both oversampling rate of 1.2 and 3. On the other hand, the results of MC and QMC show weak in instability at higher degree polynomial, especially when the oversampling rate is smaller. And here are the condition numbers of the model matrix with respect to increasing polynomial degree from 5 to 20. And we can see that the quasi-optimal point shows much smaller condition number and also show much slower growth rate compared to those of MC and QMC, especially at the lower oversampling rate of 1.2. And similar results can be observed for continuous function case. Here we set the five dimensional case and fix the polynomial degree to be five. So this corresponds to the number of bases here is a 252 so that the number of oversample starts with 252 plus one. So similar behavior also can be seen. So the errors by the quasi-optimal least square are notably smaller than those of MC and QMC, especially when the number of samples is smaller. And similar behavior can be seen for corner pick case as well. Bring some water. So in 10 dimensional example, we saw stochastical PDE by using the quasi-optimal least square scheme. So here we consider 1D elliptic equation with constant forcing term and zero boundary conditions. And here we assume the random diffusivity takes the following analytic form. This is a benchmark problem for uncertainty quantification. For numerical test, we set d equal to 10, so this is a 10-dimensional example, and f equal to 2, sigma 2v1, and z are chosen randomly from uniform, uniformly in minus 1 and 1 hypercube. 
To compare against other methods, we employ the GPC Galactic method. And GPC Galactic method shows exponential error convergence in this case. And since the GPC Galactic solution of order 4 induces negligible error in this case, we use it as our reference solution. And since this is a Galactic method, this is intrusive and solve exactly p number of equations, but they are coupled. The method we are going to use is a stochastic collocation using quasi-optimal least square. And this is non-intrusive. And so, m number of equations, which is slightly larger than p, but they are not coupled. So which the so resulting system is much easier to solve than the coupled one. So for example, the m we are going to use is a p plus 10. So here are the results of the error convergence with respect to polynomial degree from 1 to 4. We can clearly see that the quasi-optimalist square shows similar exponential convergence to the GPC Galorkin. And, and in this example, we really oversample 10 points. So in other words, with 10 more equations to solve, the quasi-optimalist square can achieve similar high accuracy to the GPC Galorkin. And, and also, since the quasi-optimalist square is completely non-intrusive, and resulting equations are not coupled, so it is much easier to solve than the GPC Galarkin. And here we show the error convergence with respect to the number of samples or the number of equations to solve. So here are the results, and with the similar high accuracy, the quasi optimalist sphere slightly solved large number of equations. However, uh, it is completely non intrusive, and it is much easier to adopt in practice than the GPC Galarkin. And up to here is the numerical the performance. And actually, this S value induces some asymptotic convergence property. So let's say this set is a set of k points, which maximizes S value. Then we can define its corresponding empirical distribution. Then this empirical distribution converges to something. So in determining the system, the empirical, this empirical distribution converges to the equilibrium measure of the domain. For over-determined the setup, this equilibrium, uh, the, this quasi-optimal, the quasi-optimal points converges to the orthogonal probability, probability measure of the basis, omega. So let me show some numerical example for 1D over-determined the setup. So when the Lujangular polynomials are used, the underlying probability is uniform. So here we show the CDF of it as a red line. And blue is the empirical distribution. So this is the result of when, it, when n equal to 10, 20, and 30. As you can see, when n goes to higher, empirical distribution is getting close to the asymptotic distribution. And similar behavior can be seen for Chebyshev case. And in this case, the asymptotic distribution is arc sine distribution. So this is the result of when n equal to 10, 20, and 30. And as you can see, empirical distribution is very close to the asymptotic distribution. And similar behavior can be seen for Jacobi 1-5 case. This is the when n equal to 5, 10, 15, and we can see the similar behavior. And now let me move to the second topic, which is correcting data corruption errors. Again, still I'm interested in approximating unknown function using its samples, and here is our approximation. But in this case, we do not have exact function samples, which is we, we only have its corrupted samples. And let me explain details what means what mean by corrupted. So the ideal data is f, the exact samples of unknown function, f. The actual data we obtain is b, which is f plus e s. This e s is the corruption error. This is not the same as the standard random noise error, which usually modeled by random variables. And magnitude-wise, this corruption error could be very large. We do not have any bound for this or any assumption on the magnitude. And, uh, and also it is sparse. 
And the obvious goal is we want to construct an accurate approximation, which eliminates the effect of the corruption error by only using this corrupted data B. The method we are going to use, as I earlier mentioned in the very beginning, ah, sorry, let me explain assumptions first. So here are the assumptions we made. First, our target function is uniformly continuous. And the second assumption is our corruption error is sparse and non-trivial. Sparse means that the number of the portion of the corrupt, corruption, corrupted data shouldn't be too large. So if more than half are corrupted, we cannot barely distinguish which one is really true or not. So S is relatively, has to relatively smaller than M. And the magnitude, the non-trivial means that in magnitude wise, the corruption error shouldn't be too small. If the corruption error is too small, then we can just treat them as the standard random noise. And third assumption is our samples are chosen from a sampling distribution mu in IID manners. And that's the all assumptions we made. So we do not make any probabilistic assumptions on the corruption error. And the method that we are going to use is a classical method and which I already I mentioned in the very beginning is the least absolute deviation method. So here A is our modal matrix or a fundamental-like matrix. And the data we actually have is corrupted, which is B. So we are, what we are going to solve is B minus AC in terms of one norm. And here we denote its solution by C star, then resulting approximation can be written as follow. And here is the remark. For consistent overdetermined system, that is, there exists a unique solution which satisfies AX equal to B exactly. Then LAD, the list of, the, it was shown by Candace and Tao back in 2005 that LAD can effectively eliminate the corruption errors. However, in function approximation, the system is never be consistent because of the approximation error. But of course, we are excluding the case where the target function lies in the approximation space. And also, the least absolute deviation method is known to be robust against outliers in data. Outliers are rare and extreme. However, corruption is more general concept in the sense that this can happen a lot often. For example, 30 to 40%. Before I jump to present the main theorem, I need to present some probabilistic results. The first one is based on assumption three, saying samples are randomly chosen in IID. Let's say x1 and xm is the set of points we collect. Then we can divide this group, this sample into two groups. One is the corrupted samples, where the actual corrupted data are collected and uncorrupted samples. And then we define the following probability of some event. So this is a probability of, for each corrupted samples, there exist uncorrupted samples nearby. And such uncorrupted samples are unique, so distinct. So naturally, when S is fixed, R is fixed, and when M goes to infinity, this probability goes to one. And actually, this goes to one overwhelmingly. Then with this probability in mind, the second result is on the based on uniform continuity of the function. Suppose the coefficient vector is bounded, then with overwhelming probability, the following holds. So basically it says for any uncorrupted samples, and it can be bounded by some uncorrupted samples within epsilon. And this here, R star, depends on function and epsilon, so we denote this probability by this to explicitly show that its dependency on function and the epsilon. Now we are in a position to present the main theorem. And recall that 
the actual solution we can obtain in practice is C star, which minimize the B minus AC in one node. And here B is a corrupted data. For reference, we also define ideal solutions, which is unavailable in practice. So CLSQ is the least square solution using perfect data vector F, which is un unavailable. And similarly, we define CLAD by L1 minimization with perfect data, and denote its corresponding error by tau2 and tau1 respectively. Now this is the main result. If the kernel of the model matrix A satisfies the following RIP condition, then, with overwhelming probability, the following <coughs> bounds hold. As you can see, C star is the L1 minimization using corrupted data B, and the, the error is measured against the true function samples F. The lower bound can, is straightforward by the definition of the least square. The interesting part would be upper bound. The upper bound involves tau1 and tau2, which is the ideal error from least square and LAD using uncorrupted perfect data F, again, which is unavailable in practice. And here C0 and C1 are universal constant. And yes, yeah, and this holds with overwhelming probability. This probability becomes important when I show the numerical example. And here, this RIP constant is defined as this. So for any t with a polynomial less than s, then s RIP constant is the smallest number between 0 to 1, satisfying these inequalities. The underlying mechanism behind this theorem is on the following equivalence. The overdetermined L1 minimization is equivalent to constrained L1 minimization. And what this actually minimizing is, is the corruption error plus approximation in the sense of L1 norm. And we do have an interpolation result. This is somehow useful when, I, when we interpret the result. So theorem by Kazjo 2002 saying there exists a solution, C star, such that B minus A C star has at least P0 entries, which means that it's interpolating at least P data. Then by using this theorem, we obtain the following theorem. With overwhelming probability, our solution interpolates P, at least P non-corrupted data. So in some sense, by using LAD, this automatically finds some uncorrupted data and interpolate those points. And now let me show some numerical examples to show its performance. And here are the test functions we use from GANs. And in two-dimensional case, we also use the Frankie function. And here we use corruption rate in order to express the number of corrupted data. S, so which is alpha times M. First example by radial basis in 2D, our target function is Frank function. And we employ Gaussian basis function as our radial basis. And here we set the corruption rate to be 5% and generate the corruption error is of roughly magnitude of 10. And here are the error plots with respect to increasing number of bases. Uh, to compare against other methods, we also show the result by the standard least square using uh, standard least square using corrupted data as red line. For reference solution, we also show the result by the standard least square using perfect data. So PLSQ stands for perfect least square, which using uncorrupted perfect data F. On the left, results are generated on 664 number of samples, and among them, 33 are corrupted. And as you can see, the LAD solution stays very close to the perfect least square solution. On the other hand, the least square solution shows no accuracy at all. 
How do you make sure that you satisfy the assumptions in your theorem? You that's a good I that's a good question. Actually, we don't we couldn't check because typically this RH condition is not easy to check. But but even before that you had this assumption, right, that within every for every point there exists an That's a that's a really good question. Exists. I mean, then you probably can't good test numerically, right? And numerically, I mean, like it's something like that. This involves like uniform continuity. Like for example, you know that F is a uniform continuous, but you cannot tell which radius you have to say. Like for example, if epsilon is one, then we know that there exists R such that for any x and y within the ball with the radius satisfying uniform continuity, but we don't know what R is in practice. Well, if it's Lipschitz continues, you just bound the derivative and you add it. No, no, no. So, then epsilon could be big, right? If that is the case, then, yeah, definitely works, but I haven't tested because I had I had tested for rough gas, like set, setting the R to be 0.5, and works pretty well. Works pretty well. But I don't have any um, practical. I guess the question that I'm asking is how much the theory describes reality. You have a wonderful result here. There's no doubt about that. It, the question is, does the theory explain it? Does it that, satisfy okay. it, you know, all the assumptions? You know? That's a very good question. Actually, I still keep thinking about this. So one part is uniform continuity. We don't know how uniform the target function is in practice. That's the yes. first thing. The second thing is checking RIT condition. I checked all of the literature using RIT condition, but I never seen anyone checking their example satisfying this condition, or even the number of samples grow. So, so wait, what is F? F is a target function. No, it's after that. Ah, pardon. So F is a matrix satisfying F times A equal to zero. Ah. Yeah. Mm. In the paper by Ken, Kenneth uh, and Tal says, they, they <laughs> yeah. okay. so I just yeah follow their. It's a basis for the thing. Yes, yes. Where am I? So okay, on the right we reduce the sample size, and similar results can be observed for least to square shows no accuracy at all. However, we can see that, but still NAD shows a pretty good performance. However, we can see that its performance becomes worse when the number of bases grows. And this is because though since the number of sample size is reduced, so that the probability I described becomes lower. So that this so actually this is the average of the hundred independent simulation. So as you can see, so this is most of the case is successively removed the corruption error, but in some cases it doesn't. Since since I showed before it inter interpolation property, so in other cases when the LAD fails, it interpolates some corrupted data. So the errors are roughly rising here. So, but in on average, it pretty did pretty good job. And next example is by Lagrangian polynomial in four-dimensional case. The, our target function is Gaussian function. Number of samples used is uh, m log p. And again, we are using the total degree polynomial space. The number of bases is m plus d choose d. We use the 5% corruption. On the right, we generate the magnitude of the corruption error is of roughly 0.3. And this is the error plot with respect to increasing polynomial degree. And as you can see, the LAD result is almost identical to perfect least square. And the result of the, the least square using corrupted data doing pretty good job up to this level, up to degree three. This is because at this level, the approximation error by least square is relatively bigger than the corruption error. So that in this case, the corruption error are treated as just noise. So that's why the least square doing a good job up to this level but above this level, starting from degree four, we can see that the least square solution cannot produce more accurate result. And this is because at this level, 
the approximation error by least square shall be smaller so that corruption error cannot be treated as noise anymore. So that, that's why the least square stays at this level. And similar behavior can be seen for this case where the magnitude of the noise is smaller to 0.1, but similar behavior can be seen at the higher degree, in this case starting from 6. It does not produce more accurate results. And this is the corner peak case, and in this case, we generate our corruption error from standard normal distribution. However, this is a one-time generation. Once corruption error is generated, we fixed. So this is not average. On the left is a 5% corruption, on the right, 30% of corruption. On the, right, on the left, we can see that LAD is doing a good job uh, removing the corruption error. On the other hand, least square solution does not and show no accuracy at all. When we increase the corruption rate to 30%, we can see that approximation error by LAD becomes larger compared to the perfect least square. And this is because the, since the corruption rate increase, this affects the increase in S, so that the probability affects, so that on average shows this performance. And for product, and this is result for product case. And note that in this case, the function has of order 10 to the 5. So when the, the corruption error generated from here, again, this is a one time generation and fixed. All three methods show a similar behavior as the, the corruption, the magnitude of the corruption is very small compared to this function value. So we make the corruption error to be big, to be realistic in this case. So we generate our corruption error from here with the standard Gaussian distribution with the times the five mean variance 400. Then we can see the big difference. So again, LA, the least square shows no accuracy at all, and, but LAD doing the good job for removing the corruption error. And similar behavior can be seen in 10-dimensional case as well. So the, this is the Gaussian case. And corruptions are generated from Gaussian distribution, 0, 1, one-time generation, and fixed. And on the left is a 10% of corruption. On the right is a 30% of corruption. We can see that LAD is doing a good job for removing corruption error. On the other hand, LAD shows no accuracy at all in both cases. Okay, here is a summary. So in this talk, I presented two things. One is quasi-optimal least square, and the other one is correcting data corruption errors. The quasi-optimal least square by S-optimality shows almost the optimal accuracy at any given number of samples. And more importantly, this procedure is non-adaptive. So before you collect the data, this strategy tells you where to collect the data first. Thus, this provides a robust set of points for least square. And the second topic can be summarized into one sentence. The LAD method can effectively eliminate the effect of corruption errors in the data. And we do not make any probability assumptions on the error, and LAD actually can be easily implemented by using any standard L1 solver. Yeah. And here is the reference, and thank you for paying attention. Interesting talk. For an ignorant like me, yeah, I think you talked about that, but could you repeat it? Uh, you're minimizing in L1, but judging the results in L2. Ah, okay. Right, so, so where's the, where's okay. the key point? <clears throat> o only, only difference is, because if I, I, can, I, I can use, you mean the reference solution, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. No, it's just the whole concept, right? I mean, yeah, apparently your quality measure is L2. You're displaying the results of the L2 yes. corrupted and yes. uncorrupted, but the minimum is in L1. Exactly. So, so where is the miracle? Where, where, so where, is, where is the mechanism? I think yeah. that I mean, corresponds to this. Like, when you see the Candace, Candace and Taos paper, they're doing L1 minimization, but they're estimating their error in two norms. It's, it's, the two norm is, is, is kind of uh, the accepted error quality. They really want to minimize. 
But if they do at least squares in the undetermined case where the compressed sensing does, it completely smears the solution. The least squares solution would typically not pick the sparse. Because it's an underdetermined case, you have infinitely many solutions. You have infinitely many solutions. And the, and the point is to pick a solution with a possibly small support. And that is not gotten by the, the, by the least squares by the least squares method, but it is gotten by the L1 minimization. Let me rephrase my question. Suppose I do not the L1, L2, but let's say L, you know, three halves and L2. Am I going to see the same effect? Or is it something in, very... in a milder form. In a milder form. In a milder form. Um, okay. Maybe in after the talk, I give you the small cartoon and you see what, yes. why it is. Okay. Okay. You can see it. You see, it's, it's a sense essential. It's not just a trick yeah. in the proof. No, it's no, very no, no, essential. No, it's an essential thing. I, I want to go back to your uh, this miracle function. It's S optimality, ah, okay. right? Um, this this looked uh, really good. I tried to understand it from from a different uh, from a different level. So this only takes the basis into account. Yes. And the location of your points. Exactly. In other words, it takes the measurement functionals into account and your approximation space. This is exactly the scenario that was uh, presented by Ron DeVore. And uh, he was showing that the least squares error, if you, if you, that was more general, but if you specialize it to this case, he was asking for the mu factor mm -hmm. that you get when your measurement functionals are here the Dirac's, and when the approximation space, what he called V, is spanned by certain orthogonal polynomials. And he was then showing if this mu factor, which you can interpret as the inverse of, of the smallest singular value of a cross correlation matrix, if this mu factor starts to, uh, to grow, then it overweighs the, the, the accuracy. So, my but, but on the other hand, in order to evaluate, in order to optimize with respect to that function, what do you actually do? Uh, this works on the full matrix, right? Yes, full matrix. Uh, and actually, this works for any size of matrix. I mean, but your selection of uh, what, what, does, what do you actually do to select uh, your, your M? Your ah, M so rows. in practice, yeah, what I use do? a greedy algorithm. You, you use a greedy algorithm with respect to this criteria? Ah, uh, yes. So there is a little technical subtlety because S value will always be zero when the number of samples is small compared to the column. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, but that corresponds to that mu function was was also infinity, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That, that's so, the same thing. Yeah, well, initially, sure. No, no, yeah. no. That, that, is, that is for granted. Mm -hmm. The number of measurements has to be larger than the number of, 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 of trials. Uh, so yeah. what you're asking is how to actually compute uh, as part yeah, of yeah, exactly. how, how, do you, how do you actually compute, select the end? Yeah, so that's a good question. So actually, I shrink the size of the matrix to be square initially. So we select, for example, the first point can be selected randomly or choose the one whose the first basis had with the biggest magnitude, something like that. And we eventually, starting from a square matrix, and eventually add one more column and make a square matrix of size two by two. And we compute the, the S value on the such two by two size of matrix and select the row which with the biggest S value on that square matrix. And eventually we grow in the size of matrix of two. This is a, this is a, this gives, if you really have to grow further, mm. this is very expensive. I mean, you have to check a lot of cases. That's a good, uh, that's a good question, and we are. You can, you can see it has a determinant, so it looks very expensive. But I have a procedure to eliminate the computation of determinant. So it only it does not we we do not compute any determinant at all. Even at I mean, if you count computing a scalar value as a determinant, okay, it counts one, but except for that, we do not compute any determinant. So it can be efficiently can be computed. So for example. In my case, so but you you basically have to do. I mean, you have you have so many rows, mm -hmm. and to find the optimal subselection, you exactly. essentially have to do capital M choose little right. M, 
And that is, a, that is a very... <laughs> yeah, that's the optimal thing we can try, the optimal thing. But in practice, I use the greedy, so... Ah, but, but, but you have no... But you can't, you don't, you can't really say that greedy gives me the optimal. I, yeah, you're right. In general, you're right. But there are some cases that I can exactly find the optimal <laughs> point, which gives the exact S value of 1. But there are a few cases. Okay, let me understand it better. So, you, in the beginning, you choose this M, uh, M. capital M. Yes. Uh, the matrix with capital M. And yes. then you do this selection. Yes. So, I didn't understand completely. Do you optimize greedy with respect to this quantity, or you choose some other quantity which kind of mimics that? So I use this quantity, but the what greedy. I use gre the in, greedy. In, the greedy. in greedy, okay. in greedy there are two issues. Suppose you already have the p selected point somehow, then you can start to apply greedy on this, right? Yeah. But well, then, the p plus first. Yes. Then the question becomes I mean, how to select the first p point, right? Then that's a good question. So what? Well, uh, no, greedy but, means that you select p and then you select uh, p plus first. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, so what I'm saying is greedy can start from that that part. That's the first thing. Greedy has to start with a matrix, with a square matrix. Mm -hmm. So and he has to select the first guy. So and he then has to you select someone, choose M. And then he increases. Yeah, but you choose how you choose the first. I uh, So my, my code first choose random randomly, or mm -hmm. I choose the, the, since this, if you apply the greedy, it has to depend on the ordering of the bases, right? Mm -hmm. Then I choose the one who has the biggest value on the first basis. If the first basis is constant, I just simply choose the first one. And performance-wise, I don't see big difference. I test it a lot for different choice of the first. But, but first, first sample doesn't do much to job. Well, in this particular case, because um, for few points, um, the, the point samples and your polynomial basis <coughs> is well aligned. Yeah. So, so, but it, you're so, right. Yes. Yeah. It, it, so I try to understand it from this this other point of view. So it would be interesting to see in what sense this quantity gives you active indication yeah. of the best subspace selection. Yeah, I don't keep thinking about that. So you've been assembling well. that always on a cube, right? Okay. Yeah, minus one n. But um, I do have, because this is a, the original version I proposed. So there is another version for unbounded, which works on bounded case as well, which involves the Christoffel least square. I'm not sure whether you. Heard. Uh, so it's basically weighted the least square using weight, weight value using the Christoffel function, so-called Christoffel function. So with a combining, because as you can see, this is, since I even I present this in the function approximation framework, you can just say any A, basically. Then if that is the case, then we have to seek some colonal orthogonalities. then you are applying the QR factorization, then we apply the Q on this. So for unbounded case, there is some there is some work, but doesn't that involve some equilibrium measure, which is <clears throat> unknown for a moment for multivariate case. So we did not <coughs> publish that result, but it works well. So, so but for what you are describing, I, I could think that you practically don't need this capital M at the beginning, you can kind of randomly select or use some other procedure to select them and still... That works, this. that works. But the performance why is not that satisfactory. Like first P point, like I also ch can choose from uniformly, but performance wise is not that so satisfactory. You, and also... You're saying that first you have to put a lot of efforts to select the same points. Yeah. And then... Exactly. Then you, you yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's clear, but you can kind of slowly grow that. that uh, so there's, there's, a, yeah, but there's a huge number of candidates for the point, yeah. but there's no function evaluation. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a big point for all that.
Yeah, and the functional relation, of course, is in this context, is a solve for the QD. So, in a sense, this, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm completely out of this, but, but it's like trying to figure out the, uh, the optimal quadrature points. Yeah, exactly. So, as you can see, uh, there it is. So, as you can see, you see the empirical distribution. These are the zeros of the, I mean, close to the zeros of the, yes. Uh, currently, I don't have complexity analysis. I haven't done any effort, but I think that's, that's a little different question, like solving a least square cost-wise or cost-wise solving just a simple least square could be smaller because don't do any uh, procedure to select a point. Yeah. But performance wise, so are you asking the performance analysis? Yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm asking like when I know uh, I should, it's worthwhile for me to spend time on the offline to select the optimal points. So, when? what kind of problem? Like for reducer basis method, if we only have two input parameters, we don't have to use a reducer basis method. I think that depends on you. Like, if you want to carefully select a point, then you use this one. But if you don't care, then you're sufficient enough to select a point randomly, and you believe that should work well, then you can just go for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.